Hi there. My name is Craig Burton, and I run the Pitch to Policy campaign at Global Buildings Performance Network. What you see in front of you is the title slide of a pitch, similar to the ones that our teams make. The pitch has eight slides, and each slide has a very important purpose. And I'm going to use this format today to introduce Pitch to Policy itself. As it says, its goal is to bring innovation to local and regional governments. Cement and steel are the kind of king and queen of the building industry at present. And so the opportunity to reduce our carbon emissions lies in providing alternative practices um, new building innovations, building efficiency, and uh, behavior change for building occupants. This is the second slide of my deck, and you'll notice at the bottom left it says the opportunity. The second slide in every pitch to policy deck is about what could be and how big could it be. The problem with cement at the moment is that it's a uh, highly carbon intensive and it isn't recyclable. Uh, concrete can only be crunched up and used as aggregate. It also uses a lot of uh, fuel and emits a lot of carbon dioxide to move it around because it's so heavy. If you think that's bad, steel's about 25 times worse in terms of its emissions. It is recyclable and a lot is made of recycling steel, but it takes nearly half the smelting energy to recycle steel each time. So the opportunity here is to try and avoid using these materials, come up with something else. Some of the things proposed by our teams as alternatives in the built environment include things like bamboo. Now, bamboo is not a new technology. It's an amazing substance. It's actually got a stronger tensile strength than steel. It certainly grows a lot faster than ordinary structural timber. Because it's actually not a tree, it's a grass, it can be cut and harvested multiple times. Down the bottom here, you see an energy modeling tool. These tools have never been less expensive and more available in the world and more friendly and easy to use. And what these tools can show any designer is how good their building is in terms of its energy performance before they even build it. The background to pitch to policy, or the thing that really has come before pitch to policy, is this whole concept of startup innovation. And startups, uh, the lucky ones, get to join incubators. And one of the most famous incubators in the world is in California, and it's called Y Combinator. And it has uh, incubated more than a thousand startup companies. And it claims that 137 of them are performers, which means that they have actually led to um, profitable businesses. That's a great, uh, great outcome in the startup field. Climate Launchpad, which, from which um, Pitch to Policy is derived, is a kind of a competition for innovators and entrepreneurs with the constraint that they must be proposing sustainable um, products and services. It's funded by the European Union uh, called KIC, um, and it has so far handled 2,000 um, small groups of people, companies, individuals, and it has a claim that 20 have actually made the Forbes list. So the Forbes list is a very prestigious list of companies that are um, not only uh, successful and profitable, but um, very profitable. So 20 out of 2,000 it's still a fantastic result. In the middle of the screen, you can see Climathon. Climathon is another program by Kick. Climathon has the format of an intensive around a specific problem. It's rather like GovHack. Uh, GovHack is a program that's run in Australia and the government comes forward with a challenge that it's having and perhaps some data that the government has collected and volunteer computer programmers and others come together for an intensive 24 hours to work on that problem and craft solutions for the government. This is a great program 
because it really does enlist the participation of a government and it's creating solutions that don't actually have to go and prove themselves in the market. GovHack uh, reports that it's had about 440 teams, it's had many more apply, but it was very hard to find out what the follow on was. So it was hard to find out what innovations had been hacked or brought together that were actually then deployed successfully into governments. This was hard to discover. More conventionally, governments benefit from innovation by performing outreach. This one here is a research and development program from the Indonesian government. And the Australian government promotes what it calls industry growth centres, where um, business comes forward with its, with its proposals and its solutions, um, hopefully to be used in um, public-private partnerships or in demonstrations with the government. However, it's simply the case that it is hard to get new innovations to market successfully. The failure rate is, is very, very high. And this is due in part to the fact that sustainable innovations in particular are competing with high energy market incumbents. So if you wanna replace cement or steel, you're competing against a product and supply chain that's highly optimized, product that's inexpensive. Government regulation of markets is still immature. And these partnerships between governments and innovators are still very, very few. This is the landscape um, which pitch to policy enters. There's a good reason why not many inventions, not many innovations make it straight into the government. You might say to yourself, well, if there's all these great ideas out there and there's all this evidence and there's all these great things we can do for the environment that are going to save the world and make us money, why aren't we there yet? And that's explained on this slide here. This is called the situation slide. It's, it's really part of the landscape, but it's a description of the current tensions or stuck loops or trenches um, that the government finds itself in, and we explain them. In this case, um, I'm talking about really the fiery gap um, between two tribes. And this is identified by Nathan Kaplan in his work called Two Communities. We have on the one hand, the innovators on the left who are a kind of a, a tribe, and we have on the right, the policy-making people, which, which are another kind of tribe, have been identified as quite tribal. The reason that there is such a gap between them is that the research people and innovators are thinking about possible worlds. When they invent stuff, when they try and improve the world, they're thinking of a world in the future that's possible. They are also not terribly worried about the risks. If you're in the mindset of thinking about improvements, you don't tend to think about what could go wrong. Unfortunately, there's never enough money for all the inventions in the world and all the potential research programs. But by the same token, if a researcher invents something and she publishes it, she's not gonna really be accountable for how her invention is picked up by others and used. By the same token, um, ideas come when they come. They don't occur where necessarily when they're needed or where they're needed. Um, new programs and new practices don't occur in alignment with other practices. So it's not a strategic business. The good thing about the research community is that it is transparent and there is a collegiate uh, feeling in that community where information is shared. There's a, there's a culture of openness. And of course, there's publications. In contrast to this, over in the policymaking tribe, politicians have to act in the real world, right? They're not that interested in the future world. They're dealing with real world problems today. Because um, they are working with people's lives and working with real money today, uh, they have to be risk averse. Fortunately, governments are well funded. They may never admit this, but um, an important program that is a high priority for the government can usually get funded if it's well-defined and justified. Furthermore, um, national governments can print money. So um, funding can be got for important work. By the same token, 
every dollar spent by a government really has to be justifiable because it's the people's money. And so the policy making tribe is highly accountable. At the same time, anything they come up with, any new program has to be strategic. It has to fit in with a similar program or an allied program that started the year before, or even another program that's planned and that's coming. So this is a kind of an impediment uh, to the government jumping and trying something new. The government is also surrounded on all sides by its critics and the opposition, and it tends to be quite secretive. So controversial novelties and controversial programs and decisions are generally embargoed as late as they can be. So there isn't this idea of being fully open and, and sharing. And as I've said, it's tribal. And by tribal, I mean that it's consisting of small groups of people working tightly together with quite clear boundaries. Now, if you're lucky to be inside the tent, you're probably gonna be very trusted. But on the other side of the coin, if you're outside the tent, uh, you're most certainly not going to be trusted and not influential. So when you look at these two, these two groups, you can see why there's a gap between them. And it's a gap that's hard to cross. But we need to cross it. We need to form a new group of people here shown suspended in midair. Um, we need to safely form this group of people by bringing some kind of new program in. So this is our change slide. It's uh, slide number five, and it says what exactly we're gonna do to fix the situation. All right, so we're gonna need some kind of outreach to cross this chasm and support this group of government people and innovators working together. So the outreach is going to have to be built from the government side because a government needs to want to improve. There's no point approaching a local, regional or national government that just doesn't see any kind of imperative in what you're offering. So they need to be open to change. And I've called it progressive. I don't mean that you can't have a conservative government in power, but you need to have an imprimatur for change to occur. The government doesn't have to do it alone. It can be supported. There are plenty of um, entrepreneurs and NGOs out there and what we call intrapreneurs who work inside the government to support it, to adopt uh, innovations. The government will need guidance. And in fact, this is one of the things that GBPN does. It provides technical support to governments to help them write new policies, um, particularly in the built environment. But this isn't quite good enough. The innovator side or the academic side needs to extend as well. And so it needs to basically form the other half of this, this metaphorical bridge. And it does this by offering ideas that really are shovel ready. This means uh, not some elaborate, vague future program, uh, not nuclear fusion, but something that's ready to start on Monday. We expect to incubate ideas. We don't expect to take facts and ideas and research findings and evidence directly from the um, research field and just drop them straight into the lap of the government. Facts and uh, research findings need to be synthesized. Groups of innovators need to be incubated and developed and trained. And probably last but not least, one of the most important conditions for bringing innovation to governments is that the innovation needs to be open. Now, a technical report or a scientific journal report is, is open and readable. The government can read it. But an invention or a new program has to be made open. And this might mean removing some or all of the intellectual property constraints around the innovation. And teams say to me, but wait a minute, you know, um, we're going to get a patent for this. And, and this is the special source on which we are making all of our income projections. And to them, I say, look, if your idea, let's say it's low carbon cement mix, is picked up by a government and used in a demonstration site successfully, and you make it open, 
First of all, they don't have to procure it. They don't have to competitively procure it. And they can promote it. Governments look at each other, regional, national, local governments, look at each other and share information all the time. And if your idea is picked up by one government and it's a success, it's likely to be picked up by very many. And you and your little company will be ideally positioned to support this and to consult to these governments and to keep innovating in this area, learning about your client, developing more types of concrete mixes for their needs, continuing to innovate. This is the ask slide. It's easy to say a lot of exciting stuff to a panel of government judges, and it's easy to propose solutions, but we really need the government to come along with us from as early as possible. And to bring this about, we make a request. And this is the ask slide, slide six. And in this case, I've put up a great example of a government intrapreneur, um, a person who bounces around inside the government who gets innovation. His name's RN Kansara. In fact, he's retired, but he took part in our last pitch to policy program in India. He was head of JITA, the Gujarat Energy um, Development Agency. And he came along and he joined our judges and he was a special guest. His role is to, to see the innovation, to get it and to understand it. And to feed back to us and say, you know, that really could work. That could work. Or he might say, that will never work. Not like that. And this kind of close relationship with our kind of target audience really helps teams form something that's going to be used. It's not just a, a fantasy. If a team asks for something, and it gets given what it asks for, it should say what the benefits are gonna be. And I've picked three examples of the kind of benefits that could be delivered by pitch to policy teams if they were given what they asked for. Eco House is an India team. They were one of the winners of our India competition. It's a house that has been uh, built and occupied for 20 years to demonstrate how efficiently a building can perform compared to conventional construction. It turns out 90% uh, less energy use. And this serves as an important uh, driver for policy ambition. The government might think, you know what, we'll impose a 50% reduction requirement on building energy use. But then when it sees an example like this, it can say, you know what, let's go for 90. LEED is another Indian organization that provides um, support to governments. And what it does is it steps in and uh, adds extra hands and eyes for the business of building approvals, in particular, sustainable building approvals, providing the additional expertise. And the outcome of this is basically the government has more capacity. More complex, sustainable building designs come through. The government quickly needs to adopt more capacity. And Reflow was one of our Indonesian teams of engineers, and they have put together an application for reusing building materials. The result being that those materials uh, only have embodied carbon needed to repurpose them and transport them. It's a product that was offered to the building sector itself. So it's intended to make, uh, to help builders pick and use um, used materials. But really the government can observe this and see, you know what? The building codes uh, could include directives on a proportion of reused materials. They don't in Indonesia, but these could be made explicit parts of the building code. So again, it's policy ambition. Who are we and what is our dream? The final slide in any one of these decks always says who the people are, what their roles are, super relevant to the pitch, and what their dream is. And in our case, the team is, is a large team. It's myself and a number of other specialists nationally and internationally. But my team includes to 10 teams 
who made it in Indonesia, the 15 who made it in India. I've also taught 13 student teams at Monash University and many more teams are coming. And our dream, and we hope that this is your dream as well, is that our teams and the governments that we're, read, that we're meeting are actually going to meet their sustainable goals for the, for the built environment and that, they, and that we meet them together. So our teams and their governments together uh, solve these, these problems. Thank you.